it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Capsule by W.B. Stickle The pothole appeared out of nowhere. Oh, son of a bitch, Miles Freeman hissed, swerving to avoid the cavernous thing. Whoa, his 12-year-old son Brandon said from the back seat. <laughs> Close one, Dad. Easing their RAV4 back into the appropriate lane, Miles glanced in the rear view and met his son's gaze. The boy's bleary eyes practically swam in their sockets, a result, Miles knew, of the pain meds the ER staff had pumped into him an hour earlier. Yeah, sorry about that, bud, Miles said. The road isn't the greatest. It's okay, Dad. It's Syracuse. Yes, it is, Miles agreed. Pothole capital of America. Yeah, how's the leg? Brandon glanced down at his heavily bandaged thigh. Achy. How many stitches did I get again? Eight, which you took like a champ. Think I'll have a scar? Yeah, probably. The boy grinned dopily. <laughs> Battle trophy. Miles reached back and touched the boy's hand. Hey, uh, I want to talk about what happened. In more detail than you told the doctors, I mean. Brandon shrugged. Okie dokie, doggy daddy. Mal smirked at that. One of his favorite lines from True Romance, that badass Christian Slater flick from the early 90s. The boy had never actually seen the movie. No, the violence in it was far too excessive to show a child. Brandon had simply heard Mal say it once and thereafter adopted it for himself. All right, knucklehead, do me a favor and shut your eyes. Why? Just humor me. I'll help you concentrate. Brandon closed his eyes. Okay, they're shut. Good. I think back to this morning when you got the ouchie in your leg. Okay, I'm thinking about it. I'll picture what happened and describe it the best way you can. Well, Brandon said. I was grabbing branches for the trail like you told me to. I saw a nice big one in the area that doesn't have any trees. Something tripped me as I went to grab it and I fell over. My leg went right into the metal thingy. Miles nodded. They'd been in the woods bordering their backyard, working on their big summer project, creating a system of trails in the dense underbrush that grew back there. Brandon had chosen to hunt for branches with which to line the trail, while Miles used a pair of hedge clippers to clear the actual pathway. After a time, Brandon had wandered out of sight into a nearby clearing. Next, Miles knew the boy was screaming bloody murder. Miles found him sitting on a log, palms pressed against his bleeding thigh. The uh, metal thingy, Miles said. Sticking up out of the ground then, like at an angle or something. Yeah. I know you told the doctor you couldn't really remember, but think hard for me. Was the metal thing smooth or rough? Brandon shook his head. I don't know, it happened real fast. Miles pursed his lips. The ER doc that had treated Brandon couldn't say one way or the other either. What she could say for certain was that the offending object had been rusty, given the tiny rust flakes she discovered while abrading the wound. Uh, no worries, Miles said. So, uh, the thing poked you. What happened next? Brandon caught his head like a dog king into an interesting noise. There was a sort of a breaking sound, a snap. Then I fell down, and I saw there was a piece of it sticking out of my leg. So I yanked it out and dropped it. Now that was new information. A uh, snapping sound. You think you broke it off or something? Brandon opened his eyes. Uh-huh. Yeah, just remembered. Yeah, after that it hurt real bad and was bloody. So I did like you showed me to make the bleeding stop. Oh, I'm real proud of you for that too, Miles said. Yeah, quick thinking. It occurred to Miles then how fortunate they were that the object had merely pierced the boy's leg versus his belly or chest, or, God forbid, his head. Oh, the very thought made Miles queasy. He truly couldn't fathom an existence without Brandon. It was hard enough losing the boy's mother in childbirth. 
If he ever lost Brandon too, didn't know what he would do. No, that was a lie. He knew exactly what he would do, and it involved the Mossberg 500 shotgun tucked away under his bedroom closet. Miles brushed the awful thought away and ran a hand through his curly mane, which some people said made him resemble a taller Patrick Dempsey. Hey, uh, you hungry for lunch yet? I'm starving, Brandon said. Mediterranean? Brandon's eyes arched. Mediterranean was his favorite. Yeah, sure. Pira Palace? Yeah, yeah, yes. All right, pal. Pira Palace, it is. By the time they finished chowing down, Brandon was in tears again from the pain. Miles gave him hydrocodone, as prescribed by the ER, and got him set up on the living room sofa. A uh, Xbox or Oculus? Miles inquired. Xbox, Brandon said. Minecraft Retro. <sighs> Shocker, but that's okay, you deserve it. Do all the mining and crafting you want today. Miles handed the boy a game controller. If you're okay for a bit... I need to go out back and look around for whatever poked you. Make sure it's safe. Coolsies, Brandon said, turning his attention to the living room's 65-inch TV. Before heading out, Miles hurried down to the basement and retrieved their walkie-talkie set from the workroom. Yeah, here, he said as he returned to the living room. He placed one of the handsets on the end table next to the sofa. If you need anything... Use this to reach me. You remember how to use it. Push to talk? Ah, correct, Amundo. Miles tussled the boy's hair and headed for the back door. During his youth, Miles had spent a lot of time outdoors. His own father had been an avid outdoorsman and took care to instill his spirit of adventure in Miles. Miles had wanted to do the same for Brandon but the kid preferred exploring the wondrous landscapes of his imagination over those in the real world. If it wasn't written in one of his books or coded into one of his video games, well, he just wasn't interested. Fortunately, that all changed the previous summer after Brandon finished reading The Wild Folk by Sylvia Lindstedt. They'd been on the back deck at the time, letting their dinners digest while they gazed at the woods that lay beyond their property line. Dad, Brandon had said, I want to go into the woods, make a trail through the trees. I think I belong out there. Miles had been so happy he nearly cried. <laughs> Absolutely, he said. And thus, the big summer project was born. Smiling at the memory, Miles stepped onto the back deck and eased the sliding glass door shut behind him. The afternoon greeted him with a sweltering embrace. Oh, good Christ. He said, checking the weather stats on his phone. 92 degrees, it said, with 80% humidity. Already beginning to sweat, he wiped his face and vaulted off the deck into the backyard. It was marginally cooler once he reached the trailhead, as the woods canopy provided plenty of shade, but the air was still stifling as hell. Wondering if he hadn't somehow been magically transported to the Mississippi Delta, he followed the path as it zigged and zagged its way through the dense cluster of oaks and pines that studded his little swathe of central New York. With the trail's terminus, Miles discovered the hedge clippers he'd dropped earlier when Brandon had cried out. Uh, oh yeah, he said, holding the clippers up in front of him. Well, he couldn't say why, but in that moment he found their slender blades oddly comforting. Mm, comforting, he mused unsure where the sentiment had come from. What? Did he think some sort of threat existed out amongst all the fern, ivy, and honeysuckle? Like a rabid fox or a killer rabbit? <laughs> sure, Miles said. Why not killer bunnies? I hear they're all the rage this season. Yeah, having a watership down moment, are we? A voice inquired behind him. Startled, Miles whipped around in a panic and instinctively readied the clippers for combat. Oh, easy there, said Jacob Winslow, Miles' next-door neighbor. I come in peace. As a show of good intention, the man raised his empty hands like a cornered bank robber. Oh, Jesus Christ, Miles growled. Where the fuck did you come from? Ah, sorry, amigo, Jacob replied, lowering his hands. I thought you heard me approach. 
Miles lowered the clippers and glowered down at his pale, red-haired neighbor, who stood a foot shorter than him. Yeah, I didn't hear shit. Well, not sure what to tell you, the man said. I wasn't being particularly stealthy. Miles drew in a deep breath and let it out slowly. Oh, fine, whatever. Is um something I can help you with? Jacob's brow furrowed. Oh, I uh, heard about what happened to your boy. Ted from across the street filled me in. I figured I'd see if you needed a hand with anything. You didn't answer your doorbell, so I peeked out back and saw you heading into the woods. Miles squinted at the smaller man. On top of being a prying snoop with little respect for other people's boundaries, Jacob Winslow was, bar none, the least neighborly neighbor Miles had ever had especially when it came to helping out with, well, anything. If it wasn't his bad back or ulcer acting up again, he always seemed to have errands to run or relatives to visit. Conversely, the little shit had no issue asking for anyone else's help. Yet here he was now, offering his assistance. Well, it was strange, to say the least. Even stranger, though, was the fact that Jacob knew anything at all about Brandon's injury. Other than the hospital staff, Miles hadn't shared what had happened with anyone. Hmm, Ted, huh? Miles asked. What did he say? Not much, just that your boy landed in the ER with an injured leg, and he was home now, doing okay. The shorter man observed the consternation on Miles' face. Oh, um, Ted only knows because of Gina. Uh, Gina, Miles echoed. Right. Ted's wife, Gina, worked as a nurse at the Galisano Children's Hospital. He hadn't seen her during their visit, but he supposed she could have seen Brandon's name on the patient register and decided to check his file. Miles studied his neighbor for a length, thinking, then revisited the man's offer to help. Well, he said, redirecting his attention to the clearing, if the offer is serious, I was about to search for whatever jabbed Brandon in the thigh. I only have a vague sense of where it occurred. Well, I was busy whacking away at the weeds where we're standing when he cried out. Found him sitting in the clearing over there. Jacob nodded. Well, not to be a nosy Nelly, but uh, why were you gents out here in the first place? Most told him about the summer project. I gotcha, Jacob said. You want to make sure the pokey bit isn't still a problem. Uh, bingo. Jacob considered their surroundings and glanced down at his own attire, which consisted of a Budweiser t-shirt, cargo shorts, and a pair of flip-flops. Well, I'm uh, clearly not dressed for the occasion, am I? Uh, nope, Miles said. The poison oak and ivy out here is downright evil. Yep, enough said, Jacob replied, ambling back towards his house. Oh, I'll be right back. He returned minutes later, garbed in a blue long sleeve shirt, jeans, boots, work gloves, and a fitted Yankees cap. Ah, that's a bit better, he said. Let's just pray I don't die from heat exhaustion. God, I'm already sweating like a pig. Fresh rivulets of sweat ran down Miles' own back. Ah, me too. Hey, uh, ready to get started? Yeah, let's do it. Five minutes into their scouring, Jacob came across a bulky wasp nest forged in the crook of a dead sugar maple. Hey, uh, check this out, he said. Miles stayed where he was. He wanted no part of the dozen or so wasps buzzing about the crook. Hey, uh, industrious sons of bitches, huh? Jacob grunted. Well, they've set up shop in a couple of spots around my house. I'm gonna hit up Home Depot for some supplies later and go on a killing spree. Uh, you don't use an exterminator? Miles asked. I'm more satisfying to handle it myself. Uh, if you say so, I prefer not being stung. Uh, we are all get stung sooner or later, Jacob said. Uh, that's life. Mm, maybe so. Luckily, I've never been allergic. The sound of his own words resonated queerly in Miles' head and for an instant he was bombarded by a flurry of disturbing images. A beehive in an old barn, a curious little boy with a stick, a barking dog, angry bees swarming the child, the boy slapping and whimpering at them, 
silence and stillness, the child's dead eyes staring at him. Hey, uh, Jacob interjected. You okay? Miles glanced at the man. What? No, yeah. No, it's nothing. I. Just then his foot landed on a thin cylindrical object, which rolled with his stepping motion. Ah, oh, shit, he blurted out, stumbling backwards. He nearly toppled over, but somehow managed to keep his footing. Oh, Jacob couldn't help but chuckle. Ah, eh, gravity's a bitch sometimes, huh? Ignoring the comment, Miles squatted down and began rummaging through the brush for whatever he'd slipped on. Hey, uh, there, he said moments later, extracting the offending object from a thick clump of honeysuckle and lifting it into plain view. Well, it was maybe a foot long, with one end badly corroded and the other dappled with ants feeding on a darkened substance. Jacob moved in closer to have a better look and frowned. Ah, is that rebar? Miles turned it over in his hand. Mm, looks like it, doesn't it? And you think that's what got your boy? Yeah, I do, Miles said. I was thinking it was sticking out of the ground at an angle, maybe. Brandon went to pick up a branch, stumbled, and landed on it. I'm guessing his weight was enough to snap it where it was corroded. He stooped over and recommenced rummaging through the underbrush. Yeah, hang on. Uh, it's got to be here somewhere. What does? asked Jacob. Uh, there we are. Miles switched from rummaging to pulling away large tufts of honeysuckle. A half dozen pulls later, he stopped and moved aside. Yeah, look. Jacob looked. The center of the now bare honeysuckle patch stood a rather guilty looking knob of rusted metal, its circumference matching that of the rebar Miles was holding. Well, that opens up a whole other can of worms, don't it? Mm, sure does, Miles said. First in my mind is, how far does it go into the ground? He reached down, gripped the knob tightly, and attempted to move it back and forth. It moved a quarter inch in either direction, but that was all. Miles clamped his other hand on the knob and tried again, achieving the same result. Oh, feels like it's in there pretty deep. Which means it probably didn't fall from something tall, Jacob deduced, looking up. Oh, I'm not sure what that thing would even be. Oh, me neither, Miles said. Uh, from what I understand, the whole area wasn't developed until the Renfrew Company purchased it some 30 years ago. Before that, it was just wild land. Oh, then what the fuck? Miles planted his hands on his hips. You know what? To tell you the truth, I really don't care about the why of it right now. Jacob removed his Yankees cap and wiped his brow. His short red hair looked like orange fire in the bright sunlight. Yeah, you want to know if there's more of these things out here? Yep, Miles said. Once I have that figured, I'll move on to how deep they go, and then try to solve the why. Roger that, amigo. Miles re-examined the clearing. Uh, if you're still up for it, want to help me look? Jacob flipped his cap back onto his head. Well, I'm already sweating. I don't have shit to do until tonight. I say let's keep the good times rolling. Later, after a long hot shower, Miles shuffled into the living room and plopped down on the sofa next to Brandon. Yeah, what you up to, compadre? Brandon pointed at the TV screen. On it, Jake the dog and Finn the human were battling the Ice King, who'd once again kidnapped Princess Bubblegum. <sighs> Adventure time, huh? Miles said. Well, the fun will never end, Brandon replied. Ah, gotta love the classics. Miles eyed the boy's leg. Yeah, how you doing? Brandon ran his index finger over the bandages. Bad biscuits. Interpreting that as a negative response, Miles got him another pill and a glass of water. Ah, sorry, bud. Ah, that should kick in soon enough. In the meantime, want to hear something crazy? Sure. So, uh, you know the spiky thing that poked you in the thigh? No, doesn't ring a bell. 
<sighs> Funny, Mao said. Well, I actually found it out in the woods. Looks like a piece of rebar. Steel rod they put in concrete to help make it stronger. Anyway, in addition to the piece that got you, I found the bit it broke off from. I tried to pull that bit out of the ground, but couldn't. Oh, it's in there deep. Randon giggled at something Jake had just yelled at Finn on the TV. Miles waited until the episode ended, then shut the television off. Hey, Brandon said. I want to keep watching. Well, you can, Miles assured him. I just want to discuss something first without any distractions. Brandon simpered but didn't protest. Great, Miles said. So listen, along with the rebar that hurt you, guess what I found? Princess Bubblegum? <sighs> no, five other pieces of rebar sticking up out of the ground. Brandon's face bunched up as the number sank in. Six rebar thingies? Yeah, in that clearing, all hidden by bushes and tall grass. Mm, weird, Brandon said. Why are they there? Oh, no clue, but I think they're connected to something underground. Underground? Like what? Again, no clue, but I'm going to find out. Miles then sighed and sank back into the couch. After a few days rest, though, your dad isn't the spring chicken he used to be. He thought of the upcoming work week at his accounting firm, which looked to be a hellish one. Yeah, next weekend, most likely. Awesome, Brandon said, eyes returning to the TV. Can I watch more Finn and Jake now? Miles powered on the device and handed the boy the remote. Sure, bud. Sure. The following Friday night, Miles and Brandon decided to have a pizza and movie night. Brandon suggested Cloudy with a chance of meatballs as the main feature, and so Miles ordered a couple of meatball pies. Early the next morning, Brandon crept into bed with Miles, claiming he'd had a really bad dream. Miles asked if he remembered what it was about. Yeah, Brandon said. Bad man trapped me in the basement and stuck a spear in my belly. I was screaming for you to save me the whole time, but you never came. Miles held him tight and together they fell back asleep, rising again around 10.30. After breakfast, Miles got the boy started on his math homework and ensured both their walkie-talkies were good to go. Working on the trail some more? Brandon inquired. Well, sort of, Miles said. Like I said last night, I need to figure out what all the rebar connects to. I want to go with you to help. My leg feels a lot better. I know, and I love our team-ups. But the doctor prescribed two weeks with minimal walking. You can help by resting, and we'll see where we're at in a week. Brandon sighed. <sighs> Fine. Miles gave the boy a walkie-talkie. Yeah, Same channel as before. I'll be back in a while. The temperature outside was cooler than it had been of late. Mid-80s with a decent breeze. Right, I'll take it, Mal said. From the shed, he gathered a bag of tools, shovel, spade, pickaxe, sledgehammer, and hauled it to the clearing. His plan was to start at the foremost rebar tine, the one that had injured Brandon. Dig down until he uncovered its origins, and then move on to the others. The shovel made quick work of the surprisingly pliable earth seated around the rebar. It was looser than he'd expected. It came up easier than store-bought potting soil. About two feet down, the shovel's blade struck something hard and metallic, and seemingly hollow. What the shit, Miles said. He cleared away ten more shovelfuls of loose dirt and set the shovel aside. A jagged, square foot of blue-gray metal stared up at him from the bottom of the hole. The rebar tine, he saw, was welded to the metal surface. Puzzled, Miles tapped the surface with the heel of his boot and listened as it issued a dull reverberation. Oh, definitely hollow, he said. He wondered if it could have been an old oil or septic tank, 
to some home that had once stood in the clearing. If so, it must have been one whopper of a place because oil and septic tanks weren't typically as big as this structure seemed to indicate. As to why it had rebar tines sticking out of it, no rational explanation came to mind. After radioing Brandon to see if he was okay, Miles moved on to the remaining pieces of rebar. The result was the same at each, rusty blue-gray metal and a welding joint keeping the rebar in place. He searched for words printed on the metal surface, but found none. Unsure what to think, Miles retreated to the unfinished pathway and enjoyed a well-earned break in the shade. As he rested, he came to the decision that he needed to unearth the whole top portion of the dam structure, see if he could locate any markings. He just wasn't sure he wanted to do that today or wait until tomorrow. He was on the verge of calling it quits when Jacob came ambling up the trail, shovel in hand. Well, howdy, neighbor. Back at it again, I see. Need a hand? Miles noticed the man was decked out in a flannel shirt, jeans, gloves, a hat, and boots. Um, sure. Well, looks like you came to the party. Jacob chuckled. Just got back from visiting family in Utica and could stand to blow off some steam. He reached the clearing and appraised Miles' handiwork. Ah, you've been busy. Miles filled him in on his theory about the oil-slash-septic tank. No shit, Jacob asked, kicking the metal surface with one of his steel-toed boots. The sound of it reverberating made him grin. Ah, the mystery literally deepens. Hey, uh, what's the plan? I was thinking I'd dig out the areas between the rebar and check for markings. Jacob moved to the furthest hole and readied his shovel. Well, tally fucking hole, he said, and drove the shovel's blade into the ground. A quarter after four, Miles stopped digging and peered down at his boot. His shovel had just struck something about a half foot down, something that had sounded more solid and less hollow. What's that? Jacob said, having heard it too. Miles levered his shuffle ninety degrees, prying loose a hefty chunk of earth. Oh, beats me. Uh, come help me real fast. He tossed the chunk aside and repeated the process. Jacob joined him, and together they swiftly uncovered the irregularity. Jeez, Jacob said, staring at their new discovery. Is that what I think it is? Yeah, said Miles. It's a fucking hatch door. It certainly looked the part. Circular, three foot in diameter, robust hinge, full on hand wheel, like something off the International Space Station, or the Red October. Jacob fiddled with an object attached to the hatch's lower curve. He brushed dirt off it and held it in his palm. It was a padlock. A large and new-looking one at that. Seems like someone doesn't want us getting inside, Jacob observed. Well, I have a monster set of bulk cutters in the shed, Miles offered. Ah, terrific. Let's get that bad boy and see what's inside this bad boy. Miles peered at the padlock curious why it looked so new when everything else seemed so rusty and old. When no good explanation came to mind, he said, I think we're going to save that for tomorrow morning. Ah, I'm losing steam. I want to finish digging out the top part and then go hang out with Brandon. Saying the boy's name elicited an unexpected swell of emotion and anxiety. Well, you got more restraint than I do, Jacob said, resuming his shoveling. Ah, that's cool. Adds to the mystique of it. Just make sure you come get me before you shear that sucker off. Ah, I'm dying to know what's in there. Miles transferred his gaze to the hand wheel. Ah, oh, me too, he lied. He couldn't pinpoint why, but the prospect of discovering what lay within the buried structure suddenly filled him with dread. Something bad was in there. He was sure of it. Something to do with Brandon. He tried to expel the awful notion from his mind, but it refused to go. Distraught, he plunged his shovel's blade into the ground and extracted a large clod of dirt. As he cast it into the clearing, the first wave of mosquitoes arrived, 
targeting their faces and necks. Cursing, they both applied more D.E.T. and did their best to finish as soon as humanly possible. As thanks for all his help, Miles invited Jacob to dinner, and Jacob graciously accepted. After a hasty shower at his house, he came over with a six-pack of Miller Lite in one hand and a two-liter of Coke in the other. In no mood to cook, Miles grub-hubbed a pile of KFC, and together they happily dined on the Colonel's famous recipe. While they ate, Jacob filled Brandon in on the hatch situation and its stalwart padlock. The boy was utterly fascinated by this revelation, so much so that he abandoned his meal and began limping around the living room like an agitated dog. Why is it there? He burbled as he paced. Why is it locked? What's inside? Secret treasure? Monsters? Why is the lock new? Who put it there? And so on and so forth. When, several minutes later, Miles finally intervened, he didn't bother using any of his gentler tactics. Brandon, he said, using the nuclear option. Return to the dinner table right now or I'm taking your screen time away for an entire week. As he suspected it would, the ultimatum did the trick. Brandon stopped mid-burble, processed the cost of not obeying, and promptly returned to his chicken and mashed potatoes. Ah, don't fret, kid, Jacob told him. That's the stuff we've been asking ourselves. Me, personally, I'm betting on treasure, like in the Goonies. Brandon smiled at that. Oh, I like that one. He switched his gaze to Miles. Can I be there when you open it up tomorrow? My leg's doing okay. Miles considered it as he sampled a drumstick. His gut, which still churned the echoes of the dread he'd felt at the clearing, told him to keep the boy away from the hatch. His rational brain, however, told him to quit indulging irrational impulses and let the boy participate. It was just a stupid hatch, for God's sake. Okay, Miles said, but no funny business. I say, and you do, got it? Monkey here, monkey do, Brandon confirmed. Well, that settles it, Jacob announced. We're all going. Brandon clapped his hands in agreement. Hey, we're all going. Brandon had already brushed his teeth and gotten dressed when he came tugging on Miles' comforter at quarter after eight. Dad, Dad, he said excitedly, like it was Christmas morning. Wake up so we can open the hatch. Squinting at his alarm clock, Miles told the boy to go back to bed. Oh, for an hour at least, <laughs> two is better. No way, Jose. Brandon said, dancing around the bed like a whirling dervish. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Knowing the boy wouldn't be dissuaded, Miles sat up and swallowed his annoyance. <sighs> okay, you win. I'm up. I'll go fix me a cup of coffee before I eat you. Once he was showered and had a cup of coffee in him, Miles texted Jacob to see if he was awake. Jacob responded immediately, claiming he'd been up since six and was raring to go. They met out front ten minutes later and adjourned to the shed, where they procured a sledgehammer and Miles' heavy-duty bolt cutters. Yep, Jacob said, admiring the cutters. These should work just fine. During the short jaunt out to the clearing, Miles marveled at how well Brandon's leg was holding up. He was barely limping and didn't seem to be in much pain. Yeah, how's it feeling? he asked. Brandon gave him a thumbs up. No problemo. All right, tough guy, Miles said. Let me know if anything changes. When they reached the clearing, Brandon scampered over to the hatch and grabbed the hand wheel. Wow, Dad, this is so cool. What if it's like a submarine or something? Oh, then we're all going to be famous, kid, Jacob replied. He brought the bolt cutters to the hatch and looked back at Miles. Want to do the honors or shall I? Miles motioned for Jacob to go ahead. The man beamed like an idiot and set the cutters on the U-shaped shackle. One, two, three, he said and clamped down hard. The cutters bit through the metal with ease, producing a loud, satisfying clink. 
disorienting sense of deja vu came over Miles as he watched this unfold. He was sure he'd seen something like this happen before, sometime in the past. Only it wasn't a lock that had been cut, it was a finger. His stomach churned with disgust and trepidation. He retreated a few steps and clutched his belly. He didn't want to see what came next. He didn't want to see what lay inside the tank. He wanted instead to run from this place. Grab Brandon and drive far, far away. You okay, Dad? said Brandon. Miles blinked at the boy. Uh, no, um, Tommy's upset. That's all, buddy. Jacob rattled the lock, turning it this way and that until it finally gave way. Voila, he said with glee, wrenching it off and chucking it into the nearby underbrush. He turned to Brandon then. Ah, oh, you're up, champ. See if you can turn it. Brandon smiled and approached the hand wheel. Righty tidy, lefty Lucy. Yeah, you got it, Jacob said. Brandon grabbed the wheel with both hands and tried to turn it. It didn't budge. He tried three more times without any luck. I'm not strong enough. Jacob moved in to help him. Here, grab it again, and I'll grab two, and maybe the two of us can turn it. They each gripped the wheel tight and tried again. This time it turned, well, slowly at first, and then it spun with no issue. Jacob let Brandon finish turning it all the way. Once it stopped spinning, Jacob took over and pulled the hatch door completely open. Good job, kid, Jacob said, gently setting the hand wheel against the metallic structure's rusty surface. Now, let me just have a peek, then you can look. He dipped his face into the open porthole, but promptly withdrew it. Way too dark down there. Ah, good thing I brought this. He fished a small tactical flashlight out of his pocket, flicked it on, and had another look. His head remained in the porthole for well over a minute. What do you see? Brandon inquired eagerly. Jacob pulled his head back out, his face ashen and somber. Brandon tried to have a look for himself, but Jacob stopped him. Oh, sorry, kiddo. No can do. His eyes found Miles. Yeah, you need to see. Stomach churning even harder, Miles reluctantly advanced to the porthole's edge, grabbed Jacob's flashlight, and stuck his head inside. The flashlight revealed a confounding and terrible sight. There were six rebar spikes, each about four feet tall, jutting up from the structure's bottom. Impaled on five of these spikes were five small corpses in various states of decay. The corpses of children, Miles realized. Tasting bile on his tongue, he yanked his head out of the porthole, dropped the flashlight, and stumbled backwards. After a few clumsy paces, he felt someone catch his arm. Jacob. Oh, easy there, the man said. Easy. Be strong for the boy. Miles glanced at his son, who stood near the hatch, staring at it uncertainly. We have to call the cops, Jacob whispered, but I didn't bring my cell. Hey, it's on your property, so it should probably come from you anyway. Miles collected himself and padded his own pockets. They were empty. He left his phone on the kitchen counter. Ah, oh, shit, me too. Hey, uh, keep an eye on Brandon for a minute. I'll be right back. So saying, he bounded across the clearing towards the trail. Yeah, will do, Jacob assured him. Back through the trees and into his backyard he sailed. Reaching the deck, he ripped open the back door and burst into the kitchen. The phone was there on the counter. He dialed 911, reported what they'd found, and gave the responder his address. After killing the call, he scrabbled his way back to the clearing. About halfway to the woods, he heard Jacob cry out, Brandon! No, stay out of there. Oh, God. 
The panic in his neighbor's voice sent a jolt of adrenaline through Miles' extremities, compelling him to sprint as fast as he could. He reached the clearing in a matter of seconds and found Jacob leaning over the hatch's opening. Oh, Jesus, kid, the man murmured. Why'd you do that? <sighs> What's happened? Miles yelled, snatching the flashlight from the ground and shoving Jacob aside. Brandon, where are you, pal? <sighs> Answer me. After thrusting his head inside the porthole, it took a few moments for his brain to comprehend what he was looking at. His son impaled through the heart on one of the rebar spikes the one that hadn't previously held a corpse. The boy was facing upwards, as if he'd somehow twisted as he fell, which didn't make any sense. His eyes were open, but devoid of light. Miles gasped. The world seemed to shift on its axis. He lurched backwards, falling hard onto his backside. Jacob stood over him, grimacing. No, not grimacing grinning. Why the hell was he grinning? Ah, it was quick, man, his neighbor said. Way too quick. A shot of vomit shot up Mars's throat. He ejected into the grass next to him. The full weight of what was happening struck him like a hammer to the chest. he just lost the only thing he loved. His boy whom he'd cared for since the moment he was born. His child, who meant more to him than anything could possibly mean to anybody in the world. His heart and soul. <sighs> My Brandon, he whimpered. Somewhere in the distance, a bird screeched. The sound cut through the noise in his head, giving him a horrid sense of clarity. He clambered to his feet and trundled drunkenly back towards his house. Where are you going, Miles? Jacob shouted after him. We got some tidying up to do. Barely registering the man's words, Miles retraced his steps to the house, tramped up to his bedroom, and grabbed his 12 gauge from its hiding spot in the closet. The all consuming anguish he felt was too much to bear. He had to do something about it, he had to end it. He checked to make sure the gun was loaded and returned one last time to the clearing, where Jacob stood waiting for him, shovel in hand. Well, we better get digging, his neighbor said. Miles cocked the shotgun and aimed it at the man. What the fuck is wrong with you? My son is dead. Well, I know it, partner. Yeah, rookie move on my part. I tried to stick him through the belly. Make it last longer so you could watch too. Eh, I whiffed it. Straight through the heart. Dead in seconds. Before he could help it, Miles pulled the trigger and blew his neighbor's head in half. Jacob's body collapsed in a bloody heap. Oddly, he felt next to nothing about what he'd just done to the man. His colossal grief seemed to eclipse everything else. Letting it, Miles meandered to the hatch's opening and gazed down at his lifeless son. With the lack of light, he could barely see the boy's face, though he saw enough to discern his own failure as a father and as a human being. Sorry, buddy, he cried, putting the shotgun's barrel under his chin. Don't worry, you won't be alone long. I'm going with you. He pulled the trigger but nothing happened. Just a click with no bang. He pulled the trigger three more times with no effect. All right, Mr. Edmund, he heard a voice say. That's good enough. The voice seemed to come from everywhere rather than any specific direction. We can terminate now. The entire scene around him seemed to undulate, and Miles felt a fiery, tickling sensation ripple across his skull. He shut his eyes involuntarily, and everything went black. When he tried to reopen them, the blackness remained. Don't fight it, the voice said. A few more seconds and you'll be back. 
A short eternity passed, and sure enough, things started to return. The darkness dispersed, and the scenery around him slowly came back into view. Only it wasn't the same scenery from just seconds earlier. Instead of a wooded backdrop, he now found himself in what appeared to be a small hospital room. Seated on a light blue vinyl chair, the kind cancer patients might sit in while receiving their life-prolonging chemo treatments. His clothes had been replaced with a hospital gown, and he noticed that an IV had been inserted into his left arm. <sighs> what the fuck is this? He muttered. Not much longer, Mr. Davis, the voice assured him. Gentlemen, if you please. The voice is bidding two large men in hospital scrubs enter the room and position themselves at either side of the chair. One of them removed what felt like a bicycle helmet from Miles's head, while the other slipped a sleep mask over his eyes, returning him to darkness. Davis, Miles murmured in confusion. Oh, my last name is Freeman. Where do you want him? The man to Miles's left asked. Recovery room two, thanks, the voice replied. Copy that, the man said. There was a clacking sound as one of the men did something to Miles's chair, and all at once he was moving. Following a jarring series of lefts and rights, his chair came to an abrupt halt. Soft fingers then removed the mask from his eyes, and he watched as the two men exited his new room, a slender whitewashed chamber with no furnishings. Okay, a different voice said from the speaker mounted above the room's door. Let us know when everything starts to return. Miles was about to ask what the fuck they meant when a huge burst of memory flooded his thoughts, bringing it all back. His name was not, in fact, Miles Freeman. It was Edmund Davis. He was neither an accountant nor a loving father. He did not live in upstate New York. He lived in this unnamed facility ever since he'd foolishly volunteered for the capsule project. Uh, I'm remembering, he said, quite bitterly, the grief of losing Brandon still heavy in his heart. Good, the original voice said. Now, how real did it all seem this time? Your life as Brandon's father, your interactions with others, your adopted history, all of it. Edmund clenched his jaw. <sighs> Very fucking real. Elaborate, please, the voice replied with a hint of malice. Every iota of Edmund's being hated answering these questions, but refusing to answer wasn't really an option here. If he refused, they'd likely ship him back to Mohawk Correctional, where beatings and rape were part of the daily routine. It felt like my actual life. I, I was a single parent, a loving dad. And Brandon? The second voice inquired. You genuinely perceived him to be your son? Tears leaked from Edmund's eyes. A new sensation for him, one he detested. <sighs> Not perceived, assholes. He was my son. In reality, Brandon Freeman had been the second youngling he'd taken. Excellent, said the first voice. How does it feel now, after a little time has passed? Has that perception faded at all? Edmund sneered. Well, he considered lying, but lying, like refusing to answer, was useless here. They'd proven that to him time and again during the control phase of testing. No, no fading. Not yet, at least. How did it compare to your first session? His first time in the capsule, they'd made him become Celia Blaylock, Teddy Blaylock's mother. Teddy was his first youngling. The boy he'd killed in the barn with the bees. No, not the barn, the shed. The barn was the fantasy they'd constructed in the first session. Reeler, he said. More potent. Very good. Elaborate. The first session was more like a dream, Edmund replied. I don't think I really accepted being a woman. This time was more like a vivid memory. Mm, memory versus dream, the second voice acknowledged. 
Was there anything that felt disingenuous about this scenario? Edmund lowered his chin and thought about it. Jacob. Yeah, Jacob was taller than me in real life, not shorter. In the real world, Jacob Winslow had been his killing partner, not neighbor. Prior to his suicide at Sing Sing, he'd stood six foot three. Uh, anything else? Edmund stared at the speaker. Yeah, I mean, what is it with the barn and the oil tank? It didn't actually happen that way. It was a shed and a footlocker. You never seem to remember that part, the voice said. It's the mousetrap. We aren't permitted to replicate the actual murders, so we need a mousetrap around which to build the scenarios. And you're helping us to build a better one each time. Well, not permitted, Edmund said. So, all of this is legal? Well, that's a fairly uh, malleable word, Mr. Davis. But, yes, it is. For what purpose? I mean, to torture people like me? Oh, you never remember that either, the second voice replied, sounding almost amused. <laughs> no, not to torture you. To offer you a third option. Live sentence with no parole, execution, or the capsule. Edmund scoffed. <sighs> and you think this isn't a cruel and unusual punishment? What will I even be after the sessions? A vegetable? Well, not for us to decide. And well, we shall see. A spark of anger set off a cascade of fury inside Edmund, nearly as powerful as the sorrow he felt. You really think this capsule bullshit will be used this way? In America? Probably not. It's being tested for a myriad of uses, besides what we're doing here. Any other questions or statements before we wrap up? Yeah. Fuck you. Very well, Mr. Davis. You've had a long day. Twelve full hours in the capsule. Get some rest tonight, and we'll revisit how you're feeling tomorrow. The day after, we'll conduct session three, the Lopez child. Sound good? Edmund didn't bother to respond. Splendid, the first voice said. Also, it's adorable you think you're still in America. Not a second later, the same two large men from before entered the room and got Edmund prepped for transport. This time he was grateful for the sleep mask as it covered his leaking eyes. As they got him mobile, he couldn't help but think that Jacob had been the smart one. He'd gotten out while he still had a say. There was no getting out for Edmund. There was only the capsule and the misery of dead children. Well, my dear friends, that really was an incredible story. Did not for one minute think that was where it was going to end up when I started reading that one. What about you? Thoughts, feelings, anything you want to say about that story in the comments section below the video. And as ever, I will do my best to join in the conversation. Now, you can probably tell I'm starting to finally feel better, but still not 100%. Thanks for all your well wishes and everything like that in the comments and elsewhere and Twitter and all that kind of thing. Um, it's good to be back, to be honest. Well... Yep, so that was another one from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you can share your stories with me and I can read them all for you. If you've got anything you think you might like me to read, then please take a look and consider submitting. That's it for this evening, my dear friends. Back again very soon. Podcast tomorrow night. Till then, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.